Well, good morning, friends. It's so good to be here together with you virtually to worship. And um, in this season where we've been meeting some in person and some virtually, it seems strange, um, this practice of worshiping. It can seem a little out of context uh, until you return to the scriptures and you remember what a mighty God we serve and his might and his power and his strength would be enough to cause us to worship. But he is also a God that is deeply personal. And so this morning, as we begin our worship, I would love for you to join me in um, saying this Psalm, Psalm 147 with me, which reminds us just how personal a God we serve and how that also makes him so worthy of our worship. Read with me. Praise the Lord, how good it is to sing praises to our God, how pleasant and fitting to praise him. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the exiles of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He determines the number of the stars and call them, calls them each by name. Great is our Lord and mighty in power. His understanding has no limit. And oh, hallelujah, oh, bless his name. 10,000 years will just begin my song of praise. Oh, hallelujah, sing it again. I belong to Jesus, I belong to Him. I belong to Jesus, a blessed mystery. The vilest of all sinners now forgiven and redeemed. Oh, the depths of darkness His love would reach down through To cover me with mercy And hide me in His wounds To oh, hallelujah To oh, bless His name Ten thousand years will just Begin my song of praise To oh, hallelujah See I belong to Jesus, I belong to Him. I belong to Jesus, the cross that once was mine became the curse that He would bear, give to me new life. I am His forever, forever He is mine, my freedom bought Him. Paid for by his blood divine. Oh, hallelujah! Oh, bless his name. Ten thousand years were just begin my song of praise. Oh, hallelujah! Sing and again. I belong to Jesus. I belong to him.
thousand years will just begin my song of praise. Oh, hallelujah, sing it again. I belong to Jesus, I belong to Him. Well, happy Sunday to you, and uh, thanks to all who are continuing to engage with us through this online platform. Uh, certainly none of us would call it ideal, but it is still really good that we worship, that we gather, uh, that we sit under God's Word. I want to start with a question this morning. Um, how many of you enjoy a good thunderstorm? Uh, my guess is uh, many of us, from the comfort of our homes, enjoy the power of a really intense thunderstorm. Um, but my guess is we've probably had an experience where it went from, hey, this is really cool, to this is kind of scary. Uh, why don't you feel free to hit pause for just a second and turn to those who are watching this with you um, and just share about a, an intense storm situation. Maybe not the worst of your life, but a recent time where you've had an in, a pretty intense storm. Uh, several months ago, um, we decided we needed to take the kids camping. Um, this was a couple months into the pandemic, and so we were going stir crazy. This was uh, at the height of all the quarantine, and we heard that the state parks in Oklahoma were open. And so we thought, you know, we need to go out of town for a couple days and get the kids moving and outside. And um, so we drive up to Oklahoma, and as we pull into the state park and into the camping area, we see there's no one else there, and we're like, that's kind of weird, but kind of cool. When you're camping, you don't really want to be around people anyway. Um, that night, we figured out why there was no one there. Um, we got the tent all set up, and then right as we're about to go to sleep, off in the distance, I sort of hear this rumble. And I'm like, oh, it's going to storm. So we go, we get the rain fly on, uh, the kids all fall asleep, we fall asleep. About an hour after falling asleep, I wake up and the tent is like six inches from my face. There's 70 mile an hour winds trying to collapse our tent or, or blow it over. And so I immediately jump up and I sort of stand in the middle of our tent and I'm just sort of holding it up in place. Um, and then the torrential downpour of rain starts, which wakes up my wife, Jen. And so she jumps up and she's also holding the tent. Um, a little bit later, uh, about five minutes after that, as we're holding the tent, all of a sudden our hands start getting pelted and we realize the rain has turned from rain into hail. And so this goes on for probably 20 or 30 minutes. And the amazing thing is through all of it, the kids slept through the entire thing. They didn't wake up at all. And we just thought, man, that's a, that's a great picture of parenting, isn't it? <laughs> Standing inside the tent, holding it up, and them sleeping through the whole thing. Uh, but in that storm, in the power of that storm, it very quickly went from, uh, this is kind of cool, to oh man, this could get real bad real quick. Uh, I was coming through all sorts of plans of how to escape, how to survive this storm if something were to happen to the, to the tent. Storms can be humbling, can't they? Uh, certainly that one was for us because we were the only idiots who didn't check the weather. But they humble us because we see such raw power. Um, and we feel so powerful. When we come up against something that's truly powerful, like a really intense storm, we're reminded of how small and weak we are. I'm reminded of our neighbors down in Louisiana who just faced Hurricane Laura. Um, you know, the governor, no one was trying to tell them, hey, you're strong, you can take it. Just stay there on the coast and just, just stand up to that storm. No, we know how powerless we are next to that incredible power of that storm. So everyone was told to get out of there, to evacuate. What I want to talk about this morning is a power way greater than even the power of a hurricane. I want us to talk about God's power. Each week as we've been moving through this series, we've been looking at a different attribute of God, one of these incommunicable attributes, as one author calls them, the undomesticated attributes of God, the ways that he is not like us. And today, I want us to focus on God's omnipotence. You know, the universal testimony throughout Scripture is that God is all-powerful. He is omnipotent. It's a Latin word that means all-powerful. If you take the equivalent Anglo-Saxon word, almighty, 
That word is used 56 times in Scripture, each time referring to God. Now, we're not going to look at all 56 occurrences, but they break down into some categories. God is shown to be all-powerful because he is the creator of all that there is. Listen to how Jeremiah says this. He says, Ah, sovereign Lord, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. I am the Lord, the God of all mankind. Is anything too hard for me? Most of the pagan deities of the ancient world, they were viewed as sort of local gods, that they sort of had a territory, um, had power in specific territories, but that's where their power ended. Um, so each group of people um, had their God that sort of operated in their region. The Old Testament stands in, in sharp contrast to this because it proposes a God who is the sole creator of all there is. He is the all-powerful one because he created everything. Even the New Testament speaks to this, speaks to God's power in creation. Here's the Apostle Paul, Romans 1. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, and his divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. Everyone can clearly see God's divine power through creation. So God's power, it's seen in his creation. Uh, but God was not just the creator and then sort of walked away to let things take their course. No, God's power is also seen in that he is the sustainer. Listen to Hebrews 1.3. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. Now, how much do we think about Jesus sustaining all things? Probably not very much. Often I think we think God created everything like someone winding up a watch and then just sort of letting it go. We don't think about how God is still actively involved in sustaining everything, holding all things together. Um, I don't think I've made it through a, a message in this series without quoting A.W. Tozer and this week's No Different. Uh, Tozer, he speaks to why this is, to why we uh, miss out on the fact that God sustains everything. He says, One cannot long read the scriptures sympathetically without noticing the radical disparity between the outlook of men in the Bible and that of modern men. We are today suffering from a secularized mentality. Where the sacred writers saw God, we see laws of nature. Their world was full and populated. Ours is all but empty. Their world was alive and personal. Ours is impersonal and dead. God ruled their world. Ours is ruled by the laws of nature. And we are always once removed from the presence of God. In the truest sense, science observes how the power of God operates. And when it discovers a regular pattern somewhere, it, it fixes it as a law. But this is only a natural phenomenon because God is consistent in his sustaining activity. You know, the places that speak most powerfully to, uh, to God's power, that speak most clearly to God's power, um, are when God does what seems impossible. So God's people are trapped. They're backed up to the Red Sea and Pharaoh's coming for them. And it looks like it's all over, but not with an all-powerful God. No, God parts the Red Sea and his people walk through on dry ground. Or how about a God who can make Jericho's impenetrable walls crumble? Or a God who makes the sun stand still in the sky for a, an extra day. Or a God who can command a fish to swallow a prophet and the fish obeys. Nothing is outside of God's power. Even Jesus, with ease, did what seems impossible to us. I mean, just imagine being one of his followers and watching him do some of the things he did. 
So here comes Jesus strolling out to you in the middle of a huge lake, walking on top of the water. Or another time in the boat, caught in the middle of a really scary storm, and you're convinced you're going to die, and Jesus just goes, shh, and the storm stops. And Jesus' friends rightly ask, who is this, that even the wind and the waves obey him? John 11 had to be the craziest scene of them all. Jesus is standing outside the tomb of Lazarus, who's been dead for days, and he simply says, Lazarus, come out. And he does. The universal enemy of humanity, death itself, listens and obeys Jesus. God's power knows no limits. Nothing gets in his way. His plan is never thwarted. He is overall and in complete control of everything that happens. So let's do this. I want to take this topic in a couple of different directions. Uh, first, I want us to think about how do we relate to God's power. But then second, I want us to ask how do we handle the power that God has entrusted to us? Okay, so two different directions. First, how do we relate to God's power? I want us to spend some time wrestling with a question that often emerges when this topic of God's power comes up. And here's the question. Can an all-powerful God still be good? Can an all-powerful God still be good? The reasoning goes something like this, and I'm sure all of us have been there at some point. If God is all-powerful and in control of all that happens in our world, why does he allow so much of the evil that we see? God's power and God's benevolence, God's goodness, they often seem at tension with one another. And it can be challenging to fully endorse both at the same time. It seems much easier to sort of highlight one and sort of do away with the other one. So God is all good, all goodness, which means he only wants blessings for your life. He only wants good for your life. But we sort of let go of God's power, his omnipotence. So God wants that, but he can't really bring it about. Or we'll let go of God's benevolence and we'll say God is all powerful, but he's not all good. And so that is why there's good in your life and also evil in your life. Uh, but the Bible unashamedly holds on to both of these, that God is all powerful and at the same time that he is all goodness. He's benevolent. So how do we work that out? I want to give sort of a short explanation, and then I want to uh, kind of talk through three examples that we see in Scripture to help explain this. The explanation goes something like this, that God is equally control of evil and of good, but that we should not assume that he relates to both in the same way. God dispenses good from his hand directly, relationally. And this makes sense. However, the evil that he ordains, he sees that it occurs indirectly. It's mitigated through someone else from whom that evil originates. God's control of good and evil, it's asymmetrical. Um, one commentator says it like this, though evil is ever so much under God's control, it cannot in the same sense and in the same way be the object of his will as is the good. So let me give you a few examples. Um, first, let's think about Job. Job's a great example because we as the reader, we actually know more than Job. Because of the first couple chapters, we get the behind the scenes conversation that happens between God and Satan. Job isn't given that. Um, so when harm comes to Job, we know that it is God who ultimately has taken away, as Job himself attests. But God's intentions in that decision are ultimately good, as we see at the end of Job. But Satan's are not. Satan intends to destroy Job. So yes, God ordained this evil, but the evil originates itself in Satan. Or think about another example. Um, think about Israel's exile under the Assyrians. 
I mean, the Assyrians are as pagan and godless of a nation as there can be. Their intent against Israel was perverse the entire time. And yet it's God who sends Assyria to punish his people for their idolatry. Now, Assyria doesn't know this. All along, they just have wicked motives, but they are serving God's purposes. They are God's instrument God uses to punish his people. But it's not God who's evil. It's Assyria. They're the ones held responsible. Do you see God's asymmetrical control? He may permit evil, though it is not just some base or bare permission. He is in complete control of Satan or of Assyria, but nevertheless, the control is indirect. He uses means, and while those means have very ill motives, God in, God's intentions are good. And in the case of Assyria, God wants to use them to turn Israel from idolatry to repentance and back to him. The clearest example in all of Scripture all we have to do is look at the cross. That's where we see God's asymmetrical control most clearly. At the cross, wicked men, evil men, put Jesus to death. And if we were standing at the foot of the cross, we, it would have certainly seemed to us that God was not all-powerful and that evil had triumphed once and for all. The intentions of Herod, of the Jews, of the Romans, they were strictly malicious and malevolent. Malevolent. And yet we read twice in the book of Acts, once from the mouth of Peter, once uh, from, from the church as a whole, that the crucifixion was the predestined plan of God. At any given moment, it can be hard to square God's omnipotence with his benevolence. Certainly that would have been the case at the foot of the cross. That's how God's providence, it looks in a moment. That's how it looks on the ground, in the heart of a storm. But if we had been with the disciples three days later when they ran to the tomb and discovered it empty, we would have realized that God's intentions were good, had our good in mind all along. Sometimes poetry helps us hold this tension between God's power and his goodness. Uh, William Cooper uh, here's a few stanzas from one of his poems. He says, Ye fearful saints, fresh courage take. The clouds ye so much dread are big with mercy and shall break in blessings on your head. Judge not the Lord by feeble sense, but trust him for his grace. Behind a frowning providence, he hides a smiling face. I love that last line. Behind a frowning providence, he hides a smiling face. So as will often happen, we'll feel ourselves stuck between God's power and his goodness. And, and we'll just have to hold on to both. The truth of God's limitless power would be absolutely terrifying without it being paired with the truth of his limitless goodness. He is not an evil dictator. He who holds all the power is benevolent to his core. That is why we can trust that he's able to work all things for our good. So in what situation in your life right now do you see a frowning providence? What situation are you waiting for God's power? And maybe you've been waiting for his power for a long time, and that makes you start to doubt God's goodness in your life. Behind a frowning providence, he hides a smiling face. I think this is going to be one of the, the great parts of heaven, is finally we're going to see how clearly good God really is. There are lots of times we question his goodness, and we just have to sort of hang on to that in faith. We struggle to see it, but one day we're going to see clearly how good God's intentions were all along in our life, through every hardship that he allowed. So I want to take a second and just give you a second to pause and check in with your God. Just acknowledge the situations in your life where you have a hard time holding on to both God's power and to his goodness. He is all-powerful. He is all-good. 
And so let's uh, just surface these situations just in a short moment of prayer, silently between you and God, where you can say, God, this is where I need to see your power. This is where I'm trusting that your intentions are good for me. And just sort of acknowledge these. He's all powerful. He can work in these situations. So let's just take 15, 20 seconds, uh, a situation in your life. Just, Just have a moment of prayer with him. Lord, in faith, I agree with my brothers and sisters that, God, we want to hold on to all of who you are, even when it doesn't make complete sense to us. We, we know you're in control and powerful over all things, and we know you are ultimately good. And yet, each of us is dealing with situations that, that make that hard. Each of us observes situations in our world, in our country, that make that hard to hold on to both. But God, we trust in your good purposes that your power is bringing about. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Let's go a slightly different direction with the rest of our time together. Uh, Here's the second question I want us to ask. How do we handle the power that God entrusts to us? Being made in God's image, each of us is given a certain measure of power. But then after the fall, all of us have become like little power brokers. We're looking for ways to use and then to amplify power to our own ends. Whatever power we possess, we face a choice of whether to use it for the benefit of others or to abuse it for selfish gain. Power, it feels good. So will we see ourselves as stewards of the power entrusted to us or as owners of it? We will either disperse our power in the interest of honoring God and helping others, or we will hoard it and we will amplify it to the interest of uh, mimicking omnipotence. We live in a culture that's obsessed with power, don't we? In fact, It's often the drive behind all of the other drives. And while there are many sources of power in our world, I think there are three that rise to the top. Our culture, it grants power to the strong, to the beautiful, and to the wealthy. So let's consider each of these and the implications of using these to glorify God or to glorify self. So let's first talk about physical strength. We lavish glory on the strong, don't we? I mean, they're the ones who wear Super Bowl rings. They're the ones who who wear Olympic medals. Uh, They're the ones on commercials endorsing sports drinks. And we will pay a premium price to watch them exert their dominance on TV, don't we? Or at stadiums. But it's easy for this to cross the line and turn into idolatry. And that filters down that kind of idolatry to us more simple folk. Uh, Our culture, it's obsessed with fitness. Now, it's easy to see how much power the physically strong have by looking at how marginalized those who don't have it are. The elderly, the disabled, the unborn. And you look at things like domestic violence or violent crimes, and they are overwhelmingly targeting women and children. The power that comes from physical strength, it goes only one of two ways. It's used either to glorify self, and then it almost always degrades into intimidation, into brutality, or we employ our physical strength to glorify God instead of self. And when we do that, we protect the weak among us with every bit of energy that we have. Our our third child, Bryce, uh, he's going to be a big boy. Uh, He's strong. He's tough. He's extremely coordinated. Uh, At age two, he was riding a two-wheel bike. He never even did training wheels at all. Um, So we've sort of recognized he's been given a healthy dose of physical strength. 
even as a four-year-old, we can already see that. And so Jen has started this sort of question response with him, trying to, to train him. She'll ask him, she'll say, Bryce, why does God make us strong? And Bryce's response is to take care of the weak. Right now, it's just sort of rote memorization at age four. But our hope is by the time he's 24, he will come to see why God has given him a measure of physical strength. It's to, it's to care for the weak. That's how he glorifies God with what he's been given. So physical strength. Our culture, and I'm sure every other culture is like this as well, also gives power to the beautiful. The beautiful among us, they live a charmed existence. Uh, they, don't, they don't have to earn any power. They don't have to coerce it. They just are simply granted power. And because of this, lots of times, there's lots of money and lots of time that go into achieving and maintaining physical attractiveness. The beauty industry would love to sell us on a lie that if we fix the outside, we will fix the inside. Have you ever noticed how um, the aging process is so much harder for those who are beautiful? That's because it is a mandatory relinquishing of power. Now, Scripture teaches the exact opposite, that true beauty begins with internal change, not external. I'm sure you've had this experience where uh, you, you see a truly beautiful person, and so then you engage into a conversation with them, and this specific person happens to be completely self-absorbed, and no amount of physical beauty can overcome how unattractive that is, right? Or you've had the opposite. You, you've talked with someone, and in every single in encounter you have with them, they become more beautiful because of the the inner beauty that they have. Our culture would grant privilege and power to the physically beautiful, but our calling as the, of, as the church is actually not to show preferential treatment, but actually to notice and treasure everyone in our sphere of influence, especially those that other people recoil from. The poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, True beauty has eyes for the least among us. So our culture, it grants power to the, the physically strong, to the beautiful. It doesn't take much convincing that with wealth comes power. I mean, this is so much part of the American dream. Um, everyone wants to be this self-made person. Wealth, it opens up doors that simply aren't opened otherwise. And to be poor is to be powerless. It's precisely because wealth confers a certain measure of power that scripture at great length gives so many correctives about how wealth is to be viewed, how it's to be employed. And at the same time, scripture contains so many warnings about greed, about arrogance, about self-sufficiency. The flip side of so many of these commands of our wealth is to care for the poor among us. So again, we have the same two options. What do we do with the power God gives us? Do we use that power to glorify ourselves or do we use that power to glorify God by helping others? Many of us sort of have a character in our minds of a powerful person. It, this powerful person is someone who's physically strong, uh, they're, they're beautiful, and they're, they're loaded, they're wealthy. And so they, they live this charmed life because they can use all of their power to make their experience enjoyable. Now hold up this caricature of a powerful person with the most powerful person who has ever lived on our planet. Jesus Christ, God in flesh, the, the one who's omnipotent. It is really significant to think about how differently he lived. Jesus never once impressed anyone with his physical strength. He never overpowered anyone uh, with his physical strength. We don't have one description in all of Scripture of what he looked like. Uh, there's the one hint in the prophet of Isaiah where he says he had no beauty to attract us to him. No majesty that we should look at him. And Jesus, he did not possess 
personal wealth, nor did he use money to gain privilege. Jesus was rejected by the Jews in large part because he didn't use power the way they had expected or wanted him to. Jesus lived a humble life, knowing that all power belonged to his Father and using the power that God had entrusted to him to serve those around him and to point them to his Father. And then he asks you and I to follow him, to model our lives after his, to take the measure of power that God has entrusted to us but not to use it on ourselves, not to serve ourselves, not to make our life easy, but to serve those around us for the sake of his kingdom. Let me pray for us. God, thank you so much for your word. Lord, thank you that it teaches us about who you are. We need to be reminded that we are connected to an all-powerful God. But Lord, it's so corrective. All of our hearts, we claw at power. And some of us may go after physical strength or beauty or wealth. Um, God, the calling you're placing on our lives is not to use that power on ourselves. Lord, I pray today you would open our eyes to see the power we have, but to see how we can use it to glorify you and to help those around us. Thank you that Jesus showed us what this looks like like in real flesh and blood. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Praise the Lord, his mercy is more. Mercy is more What love could remember No wrongs we have done Omniscient, all-knowing He counts not their son Thrown into a sea without bottom or shore Mercy.
Thanks for worshiping with us. Hey, as um, as the numbers keep improving uh, here in Texas, the COVID numbers, the cases, the hospital numbers, um, and as you feel comfortable returning, I just want to remind you what our Sunday uh, morning in-person plan has looked like. Uh, we've been worshiping in our parking lot at 9 a.m. and we've been wearing masks into our seats and out. We've been bringing our own chairs and spacing them out. And then once we get sort of a safe distance from everybody, we've been removing masks and worshiping that way. And then we've been doing our community hour uh, directly following that at 10. And we've been coming into our building and using the largest spaces. So we've had an adult class, a student class, fourth, fifth, and then the youngest kids are outside on the playground still. Um, so as you feel comfortable, as uh, it becomes safer for our community, feel free to jump back in and be a part in person with us. Um, other couple things I wanna uh, also tell you about. One, um, thank you to so many who donated food this week. Uh, we put, I think, 12 bags of food together. Some are gonna go to help the, the girls in Young Lives, the teen moms. Uh, who would desperately need some help that way. And others, we're, gonna, we're giving a bunch also to some of the families at Hope Farms. So uh, thanks for who've been a part of that. Um, and lastly, in a couple weeks, uh, we're gonna start sort of a church-wide Bible study uh, called Trustworthy, uh, overcoming our struggles to trust God. And I, I can't think of a more timely uh, study to embark in, and it's actually going through the Kings, uh, first and second Kings. And so there's going to be lots of different ways to jump into a different group that's doing that. Some virtual, some in person. So you're going to hear more about that in the next week. But I just wanted to let you know, um, that as we move into the fall, I hope you'll make studying God's word a part of your sort of daily and weekly life and doing that with other people. So go in his grace. And I pray this week that you'll be keenly aware of how powerful the God that you're connected to is.